five, the writer says, it was in a long line at a grocery store that opens just for senior citizens at eight o'clock. And a young man came from the parking lot and tried to cut in front of the line, but an old lady beat him back into the parking lot with her cane. Then he returned and he tried to cut in again, but an old man punched him in the gut, kicked him to the ground, and rolled him away. And he approached the line for a third time, and he says, look, if you don't let me unlock the door, you're never going to get in there. <laughs> he was the manager, apparently. <laughs> they thought he was cutting the line. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1 says this, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and share these morsels from your word this morning. And I pray that you will guide and direct the word. It will have the effect you want it to have and the goal you want it to go this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Isaiah chapter 5 starts out this way, verse number 1. And there are five things in Isaiah chapter 5 that say, whoa. But, it, but before you get there, it says, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard on a fertile hillside. This is all symbolic. It's talking about Jerusalem. He dug it up and cleared it of stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He put a watchtower on it and cut out a wine press as a well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. Now you dwellers in Jerusalem and people of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more could have been done for my vineyard than I have done for it? When I looked for good grapes, why did it yield only bad? Now I will tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will take away its hedge, and it will be destroyed. I will break down its wall, and it will be trampled. I will make it a wasteland, neither pruned nor cultivated, and briars and thorns will grow there. I will command the clouds not to rain on it. Verse 7, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel, and the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice, but he saw bloodshed for righteousness, but heard cries of distress. Jerusalem was his vineyard that he planted, and they went against him. They weren't the first ones, the northern tribes, the ten tribes went first. But Jerusalem, there was even a there was even a, an idol placed in the temple itself. So this prophecy of Isaiah is about Jerusalem and Judah. But there are things we can learn from it about where we are today. He predicted a destruction, and that happened when Nebuchadnezzar took the people into captivity. The five woes represent the complaints or the judgments of God against the people of Judah. Chapter 5 and verse 8 is the first one. Woe to you who had house to house and joined field to field till no space is left and you live alone in the land. Woe to you that do such things, he said. Here is a woe to those who set their hearts upon the wealth of the world and place their happiness in that alone. There's never enough for them. They accumulate with no regard for other people. It's okay to have things. God gives us prosperity. I believe that we have a right to earn what we can with the talents that we have and whatever people will pay us to do or if we're merchants to sell. I believe that we have a right to earn whatever we can on the talents and abilities that we have. And I believe further that we have a right to own what we earn. That's sort of opposed to Marxism that's rearing its ugly head these days. Further, I believe that we have the right to accumulate what we own. But we have a responsibility to pass along the blessings of God. And I don't think that it's a sin to be a millionaire or a billionaire. But I do 
just think it's sinful to be stingy. And that's what this woe is about. People have just accumulated and accumulated and didn't share anything. Jesus had a lot of things to say about the poor. A lot of things. Next one is in verse 11. It says, Woe to those who rise early in the morning to run after their drinks, who stay up late at night till they are inflamed with wine. Continues in verse 12. They have harps and lyres at their banquets, pipes and timbrels and wine, but have no regard for the deeds of the Lord, no respect for the work of his hands. Apparently, this was going on in Jerusalem at that time. Some people would be drinking alcohol from morning till night, we're told. God is declaring to the prophet, through Isaiah, that he's not pleased with the excess of drunkenness, the excess of worldliness <clears throat> and carnality leave no room in one's heart for God. Drunkenness and godliness are at opposites from each other. Godliness and drunkenness can't coexist. Alcohol lowers one's inhibitions. God doesn't want us to be lowering our inhibitions. We're supposed to guard our hearts, and that guard comes down with alcohol and with drugs. One can do really stupid things when under the influence of alcohol or other drugs. Carol and I, before we came to Christ, we used to drink beer and wine and alcohol, but we were never drunk. Never. We didn't drink to excess. We didn't drink for how it makes you feel. We just drank a sip. You know, we just, we didn't get drunk. We weren't drunks. The church used to preach against the excesses of alcohol. It used to preach against alcohol, period. Um, but they quit doing that because there was a reaction to legalism uh, sometime, I guess, in the 80s. There was a reaction to legalism, and they stopped preaching against certain things. But alcohol is a destroyer. You can probably all point to families that were torn apart because of one of the parents who was a drunk. Yes. And nowadays, a, a drug addict. Families are torn apart. Poor kids. But some people have a propensity to be alcoholic. They say it's a gene. But if they never take the first drink, they'll never become an alcoholic. Drink something else. <laughs> drink iced tea. Drink Pepsi. Drink something else. Woe to those. Woe to them. Woe is a judgment call. Verse 20 and 21, woe to those who call evil good and good evil. This is a particular poignant one for today and one that I really wanted to concentrate on today. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. This is about the attitudes of the heart. What is good and what is evil? What is right and what is wrong? Is what benefits a person that person's right is what pleases a person, that person's good. Well, in their attitude it is, but in God's way it's not. It's not. There was a philosophy in the early 60s that proclaimed, if it feels good and it doesn't hurt somebody else, do it. I think that was attributed to Dr. Timothy Leary. And it had to do with drugs. And at that time. But these woes were spoken to the nation of Israel and the people of Jerusalem. Isaiah was warning that their attitudes were upside down. They had abandoned the expressed, and I mean expressed because they had the word. They didn't have the New Testament, but they had up to Isaiah, they had expressed <clears throat> will of God and they were following their own wishes and wills. Isaiah said, woe to them. In other words, judgment is coming. God is not mocked. We live right now in an upside down world. Modern attitudes are diametrically opposed to God's will. Right and 
wrong has to be external. You don't determine in your own heart what's right for you to do. God has expressed what's right and wrong. It's in his word. That's an external, uh, that's an external uh, standard against which to judge my thoughts. If my thoughts don't measure up to God's standard, then my thoughts are wrong. Right and wrong is what pleases God, not what pleases me. So we have to have these standards outside of ourselves against which to judge our actions and our attitudes, an external, an external set of standards. In anthropology, they refer to that as cultural mores. I can remember that from when I was in college years ago. The problem with cultural mores is that they change. The sense of right and wrong changes with social pressures. They call changes in attitudes situational ethics. The nation uh, that uh, the notion that right and wrong changes with the situation is the tragic flaw of the human race. God gives us unchanging directives. The Ten Commandments are not situational. The Word of God is His expressed will for all humanity. It doesn't change with situations. People have been going against God's will since they have been on the planet. It started in the Garden of Eden. In Noah's time, violence, it says, filled the earth. Hi, Randy. Hello. Hang on a second. In Noah's time, violence filled the earth. Woe to them. In Abraham's time, the city of Sodom was engaged in evil practices. Woe to them. In the nations of Canaan, people were sacrificing babies to their gods. Woe to them. The northern ten tribes abandoned Jerusalem and set up golden calves as their gods. They eventually started to worship the gods of the people around them, sacrificing their infant children, and God is not mocked. Woe to them. Woe to them. They were taken in the, to the Assyrian captivity. Eventually the same thing happened in Jerusalem. Idolatry right in the temple of God. Woe to them. That's what, I, that's what Isaiah was saying. Woe to them in his prophecy. There, there have always been people who flaunt themselves against God. Well, they think it's okay to do thus and such. I think that doesn't hurt anything. That's a better way. But it's not God's way. The problem is that you're not God. I'm not God. You're not God. Instead of, I think it should be thus and such, I need to know what God thinks. Amen. I need to know what His perfect will is. Amen. My wishes, if they're outside of God's will, are null and void. I must follow God. We still live in an upside down world, as far as right and wrong is concerned. If it pleases God, it's right. If it doesn't please God, it's wrong. Period. This world is on a collision course with God. Woe to this world. If Isaiah was living, he would say, woe to this world. Woe to those who think that God is not watching. Woe to those who think that they can't decide, that they can decide what they will do or what they will not do without risking the wrath of God. Right is right and wrong is wrong. But they had an upside down. They had their own idea of what was right and wrong. And that's what's in the world around us today. Abortion is wrong. Gay marriage is wrong. Those who support such things are declining or deciding for themselves what's right and what's wrong. They're deciding for themselves. But we have a standard externally outside of our own mind and heart. That's the Bible. And it, it explains what's right and what's wrong and what pleases God and what does not. We're living in an upside down world. God is seen as irrelevant. Woe to this system. There is a movement, globalism, who would rule from 
central governance making laws for all nations. Marxism, socialism is the goal. It's also their God. The excuse is what they call a crisis in the climate. That's the excuse to get the world to give up, to get each country to give up their own sovereignty and agree to this international governance. But the only one world government that we can tolerate is the one that Jesus sets up when he returns. Judgment is coming. Amen. Woe to those in verse 21 to 23. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. Those who judge themselves by their own standards, their own standards, which are changing situational standards, those who do not see uh, their own attitudes and actions in God's light. We need to shine the light of God's truth into what your thinking is, because you might be right or you might be wrong. It depends on whether God approves it and if his approvals are in his word. That's the light that we need to shine on what we're thinking. But wise in their own eyes, they are fools to God. Their foolishness leads them to destruction. The problem is that they lead others also to destruction. Amen. The Marxist standard in the universities is an example. In verse 22, woe to those who are heroes at drinking wine and champions at mixing drinks. And 23, who will quit the guilty for a bribe but deny justice to the innocent. <clears throat> talking about things that were happening in Jerusalem at this time. Here the prophet's talking about drunkenness in high places. They're quitting the guilty and denying just to the innocent. Those were the judges of Jerusalem. It refers to people in high places who drink to excess and legislate to their own advantage. And this is from Smith's Bible Commentary. It says, God is talking here about the legislators and the judges, and it is interesting that the highest alcoholic consumption in the United States is in Washington, D.C. The highest consumption per capita in Washington, D.C. of alcohol. I don't know about the drugs. I don't know. But this chapter in Isaiah begins with the comparison of Jerusalem and Judea as a vineyard, as God's vineyard that he planted there, referred to Jerusalem as his vineyard. And the first two verses said, I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My loved one had a vineyard in a fertile hillside. He dug it up and cleared it, stones and planted it with the choicest vines. He built a watchtower in it and cut out a wine press as a well. Then he looked for a crop of good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. And that can apply to today. That can apply to churches, as well as governments, as well as cities, as well as individuals. And this is an excerpt from Smith's Bible Commentary. It says, so it's significant that Paul tells us in Galatians, <coughs> now the fruit of the Spirit is love. That's in Galatians 5.22. Now this is really what God is looking for because out of love proceeds true judgment, fairness. If you really love, you're not going to be oppressing anyone. So where in the Old Testament it was, let's have righteousness judgment, let's not oppress the poor. And these kinds of things in the New Testament is put in a positive sense. It says, hey, let's love one another as we love ourselves. For if we love one another as we love ourselves, we're not going to be taking advantage of each other. We're not going to be oppressing each other, but we're going to be helping one another. We're not going to be lifting up the one that is, we are going to be lifting up the one that has fallen. We're going to be giving aid to those that are down. We're going to be concerned with the needs of others. And that's exactly what God is. That's the kind of fruit that God is looking for. 
people in our lives and in the church today that is really that is that we really have to have a genuine love and concern for each other where we are giving to one another those that are in need when one member suffers they all suffer we all step in to help the one that is hurting that is down that beautiful love within the body where we begin to bear one another's burdens and thus we fulfill the law of Jesus Christ and that's the kind of fruit that God wants from our lives. That was a commentary that I read there, but it's all true. So we live in a world now where people who stand up for righteousness are ridiculed. They're called bigots. We live in a world where people <coughs> are celebrated who mock God. Good is called evil. There are pastors in prison because they call evil the things that were evil. But those people in charge thought those things were good, so they put a pastor in prison. We live in an upside down world. Good is called evil. Evil is called good, and Isaiah said, woe to those who were doing that. This nation has to answer for killing 60 million plus unborn children. Yeah. This nation has to answer for, for condoning gay marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. This nation will have to answer for ridiculing the truth of God. Yeah. Judgment is coming. Yeah. Yeah. But so is Jesus. Yeah. Our Lord and Savior. Yeah. That's the awesome part of it. Woe to this system that of uh, the world that we live in today is getting worse every day. But Jesus is getting closer. Amen. 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 Would you stand? And we're going to have a closing song too, but I'm just going to close right here with this. Right. Dear Lord, as we have gathered in your name, even though we're few in numbers, we, the power of your Holy Spirit is here because we brought you with us. <coughs> and Lord, we pray that these morsels from your word will not only come into each of our hearts, but also be shared in the communities that we come from. And we pray that as we go forth from this place, we celebrate your power and your word and your love and keep us all safe until we come together again. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Brother Randy, the flowers in here.